you. Um, we will, like I said, we will send you a copy of the presentation today. As always, I over plan. So uh, you may see when you get the recording of the slides. Um, I'll try and finish off if we don't get through everything today. Uh, I try and pack as much as I can in to our power hours. But having said that, I also want to leave room for questions. Um, I want it to be somewhat interactive. I know there's we had 55 registrants, so having a whole interaction is difficult. But use the chat as much as you can, the chat function at the bottom of the screen there. Uh, you'll see chat, and Kristen will be monitoring the chat. And if you have anything, any questions or comments, feel free to put them in there, and she will pause me to um, to address those questions, or she can answer them herself as well. Um, and also use the reactions button. If you have something to say, you're welcome under reactions. There's a hands up button. If I say something incredibly exciting and life changing, you know, you can do the thumbs up in celebration. You don't have to do that. Um, but please, please use the tools that are there. It really helps the interactive piece. I don't want to be just a talking head, but I also realize we just have an hour together and you're here to get as much information as you can. Um, and so I do appreciate that as well. I do want to introduce you to the lovely Kristen Merritt, who is, um, Kristen has been, what, five years now? Six Going years? Six, yeah. <gasps> six years. She is um, uh, my right-hand person in all things Kaizen. Uh, she is a wealth of knowledge for executive functioning as well. Kristen has four children of her own and still smiles all the time. <laughs> now, what, if you don't mind me sharing this, Kristen, three of those children are triplets. So she is a busy young lady um, and uh, is a well-versed educator and experienced educator as well. And we often present together or co-host. And um, so please, if you hear Kristen chime in or jump in, um, this is her expertise as well. So thank you, Kristen, as well for, for joining us today. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. You guys up here, I'm working from a laptop. So I have all these little pieces, here we go. Okay, do you guys see my screen? But our child is really smart. Okay, so this question was a burning question that still happens in uh, our office today, Kaizen, um, when we're doing our intake process, when we meet families. When, and, and when I was teaching, I, I taught for over 16 years. Part of that was teaching, administration, leadership, and then moved into counseling and academic support. Been an educator for very long time, over 25 years, I guess. And hard to believe I've seen a lot of changes, as I'm sure you have seen from your own um, learning, and whether you are a caregiver or a parent, and we'll get to, to who you are soon. Um, you have probably seen waves of changes in education and in learning. And I do want to address that today. One of the burning questions that kept coming up in, in when I was teaching before even Kaizen started was what, and I asked this question, which is these, I was getting these psycho ed reports that I'm sure many of you have seen with your own children or your, um, the children that you are looking after and mentoring and supporting. And you're like, what? I don't get it. They're, they, by the numbers, they're so smart, right? Like they have, you know, if you, however, the psychologist is uh, measuring that, and we'll get into that in a moment. So why are they not successful? What's happening? Why is there a disconnect? Not always, but often. So I would have parents also say, Sam, like we're getting this psycho ed and the psychologist is saying, um, 
you know, my child is very bright. And I, and I agree, they are very bright. There's huge potential there. And we'll talk about what's being measured versus what's actually happening. Okay. Um, so I love this slide. I've used, I almost use it in every presentation because it really, to me, speaks to uh, what does it mean to be smart? So this guy here on the far side, it, you know, we giggle at it. I think it's, I think it's a great representation of what does it mean to be smart? So what, what's going on here? Is it an attention issue? Is there a reading issue? Is there an anxiety disorder going on? Why, why is this very bright kiddo going to um, a gifted, a gifted program and, and, isn't opening the door the right way, is pulling or is pushing instead of pulling. So I would like you to think about um, when you were growing up in school and what it meant to be smart. So just quickly in the chat, tell me growing up in school, what it meant to be smart. What was the measure of smart and intelligent? And feel free to use the chat function. I think this is going to be a call on grades. <laughs> grades, yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is that the common one coming up, right? Grades, grades, attention in class, completing assignments. So we're looking at then and now as well okay so now so grades was a huge measure a huge measure of success <clears throat> and still is to some extent for sure <clears throat> but are grades the only thing what does that number represent exactly that grade so present day <clears throat> excuse me for our own kids in this present day, what would you say the measure of success is in school or whoever you are caregiving for? Typically, what's the measure? And again, feel free to use the chat. Yeah, completed assignments, good behavior. Still great. Ability to organize complete work, navigate internet, grades, yeah. Coupled with grades, yes. Mm -hmm. Participation, organization. Mm -hmm. Yep. Absolutely. There are measures of success. So grades still matter, right? Ultimately, if we're applying to post-secondary programs, ultimately, however, what we're seeing uh, is what are the actual skills that are needed to get those good grades? What is being measured? What are the skills? And that's what we're going to be focusing on today. So I do love this cartoon too, because I think you know, for so many years when I was teaching, uh, I was teaching at one point, I think it was grade two. I didn't actually teach grade two. I had to sum in. I, I always taught grade five and up and I had to teach handwriting and we did handwriting booklets. And some of you probably remember that growing up, the handwriting, the handwriting, the booklets, the cursive. And I know there's still research to support the validity of that skill, right? But in our 21st century world, uh, I love this because when that child gets to that job interview, right, is that actually going to be a skill that is that is going to be needed? So our worlds are shifting. And I know I'm preaching to the choir a little bit because probably all of us are in the workforce in some capacity. Um, and you're, you see this disparity between what is actually being taught in school 
and what is actually required for life and learning and career. So there is a gap. Um, today's goal is not to harp on the school system. I have my own soapbox on certain things. <laughs> you may hear that and here's my disclaimer. I want to apologize up front. I, this is not anything against teachers. I was a teacher, I am a teacher at heart. Um, in my in my opinion, this system is what whatever you want to call it. The system is where the disparity is, uh, the curriculum, what is being taught, and, and teachers' hands are tied. They are accountable to that curriculum, especially as, as the grades increase and the stakes get higher to get into university. So please keep that in mind because I, I do have issues with the skills and I'll show you the research on that, the 20, and this would be good for um, uh, if you do have a child going into high school, university, um, in post-secondary starting their career. I just sent it to my own son uh, yesterday is the World Economic Forum report that so just got released. So, and I'll, I'll share it with you today. Not the whole report, like 300 pages, but I'll show you the highlights of what came up, okay? So we do get into this, you know what, like, and some of you said, like my child, my child is so smart. And, and I'm here to say, absolutely. Our school system often fails them because it's slowly changing. It's the skills that aren't being taught. Okay, so the skills that we know to be except, exceptionally needed in our, in our modern world, the school system has not caught up. So things like time management, organization, planning and prioritization, attention, the biggie, right? All of these skills, as we were growing up in school, you just kind of learned them, or I don't know, was that osmosis? You just kind of figured it out. But now these skills we're realizing have to be explicitly taught. They have to be explicitly taught, like math, like social studies. And I'll explain why in a moment. Dr. Ross Green is, if you've been to any of my workshops before, you know that I adore this man. He is a lovely human being. Um, he's, I call him my academic crush. I've never met him, but I follow him all the time because he, his mantra changed my world. And this is a strategy into itself, his mindset when you're working with, with children and adults. Kids, people do well if they can. Now that's not earth shattering. You're like, okay. Right, but what does that actually mean? And he he talks about lagging skills and unsolved problems and behavior. His website, and I can send this to you in our well, you'll see it when you get the recording. Um, Lives in the balance. He's worked with some pretty tough cases, and he has a whole drilling down model that I can't get into today. That's a that's a week long workshop in itself. But drilling down, what is the root of the problem? So if a child is not being successful in school, okay, looking at the why, and he has a drill down model to figure out what that is. So he will say, um, he will say unsolved problem or lagging skill. That's the only, those are the only two. And since I learned that, I can't even, I don't even know how many years that was at least 12 years ago. It has guided me in working with children because behavior is just an indicator that something's not working or some positive behavior, something is working. So a lagging skill, and this is where Kaizen came into play for me, starting Kaizen when I was working with really, really smart kids who weren't doing well. I was working at a, a beautiful school. Um, really, you know, 14 kids at a class at one point. This is like, the primo for these kids. And I'm working with handfuls of children that are not being successful in that environment. Why? High potential, if you're measuring IQ and you're looking at IQ scores, the WISC perhaps, okay? If any of your children have had that or students have had that IQ test and they're, you know, 
coming in at 110, 120, 130, 140. Anything above 100, above average, right? So then we get into, you should be able to do this, right? You should be able to. Okay, and we'll talk about that. But they're failing or not meeting potential. Why? It's a lagging skill, according to Dr. Green. And it's, it, I can't tell you, I would say with 100% certainty, Kristen, I don't know if you have anything to say about that too, with 100% certainty, it's been a lagging skill in our practice. Absolutely. If it's, if it's an unsolved problem, it's often related to uh, perhaps we would refer out um, for psychological services, counseling support, um, because we know those, and I'll get into that later too, those two are, are interconnected definitely. But we're focusing on what we would call executive skill functioning, which I will get to. So we're going to do a, huh, I won't put you on the spot, I promise, but I'll give you an example. If you're trying a simulation of, of you being in school, the cookie problem. Okay. I'm going to read a problem to you. I'm not, I'm not going to show you the words. I'm just going to read it to you. And I'd like you to solve it. Are you ready? Okay. And then, yeah. Okay. I'll read the problem. I'd like you to solve who wore which color. Rachel, Linda, and Eve were friends sitting in a circle on the grass. Rachel passed three chocolate chip cookies to the person in blue. Eve passed three macaroons to the person who passed her cookies to the person wearing green. Each person passed three cookies to a friend on her left. Rachel, Linda, and Eve were dressed in red, blue, and green, but not necessarily in that order. The person who wore green did not get a macaroon. The person wearing red passed along three oatmeal cookies. Who wore which color? Answers. <laughs> ah, Rebecca's like, ah, uh, no. Okay, so this is a perfect example. This is what we do to children too, is, is often now we'll give them maybe the printout of that. So if I did print it out, and gave you a copy of that, what would be your process? What would you do to solve this problem? Now, if you're my youngest son, you would say, why should I care? <laughs> Don't care about this. <laughs> that would be my son's, my youngest son's reaction. My eldest son would be like, okay, I'm going to eat it up. Like, I want to figure this up. Um, so relevancy is, is a question for a lot of kids. Why? Now, what we want to be teaching is the how of learning, right? And this is what our kids are struggling with. Now, I'm reading this to you. So if you don't have, you know, this auditory memory, if you struggle with verbal memory, right, you're going to look like I'm measuring how smart you are, right? If you get the right answer right now. Okay, what is your process? How are you going to solve this problem? What do you need to know? How are you going to organize the information so it makes sense? What's your plan? How are you going to check for accuracy? This problem is layered and layered and layered in executive functioning. And I'll get to what exactly those skills are. Anyone have an answer? You want me to just take a guess? You got a one in three chance, I think. <laughs> so I have to ask you during this problem, right? Did you have good attention? Were you listening? How many times do we say that to our kiddos? Were you listening? Listen to me. Listen. Were you paying attention? Pay attention. Pay attention. Okay. Did you write it down? right? Were you looking at your phone? So if you're a teenager doing your homework, looking at your phone, I mean, I, I'm lost reading that. I will show you the answer in the sake of time. Okay, there is an answer. 
the solution? How do you get to that solution? What skills are required? So in the chat, tell me what skills are required to solve that problem. Listening is a huge one. Yeah, thank you, Jordan, for saying that. I started to write it down, but I couldn't keep up. And then I gave up. Reading, listening, highlighting, organization, deduction. <laughs> the question was about cookies, right? Not colors. <laughs> <laughs> Same as Jordan. And then I just tried to remember and I couldn't. How many of you got to about my second sentence and were like, oh, forget it. There's no hope. They were all wearing. <laughs> Absolutely. Peg Dawson in her workshops, I, I, I stole this from her with permission um, because she's a guru, Dr. Peg Dawson. She wrote the book Smart But Scattered. If you want to do some parent reading on supporting your child. Um, and uh, she, she uses this problem often because it's so layered. And often we take for granted the skills needed. So if you didn't get it, if you're like me, you might have felt frustrated. What emotions were you feeling? As soon as anxiety kicks in, how many of you, when as soon as I said, we're going to be doing a problem, kind of felt a sinking in your stomach? Okay, so these are overall today, we're going to, we will be looking at these different pieces. Um, I know you really want strategies. I will zip forward to that at at some point and give you some real tangibles for each of the executive skills today. And of course, getting curious. I talked to you about the future of jobs report. Um, I highly encourage you to look at it even in your own career. Um, really, that really amazing report um, that talks about, um, the, it tracks the pace of change. And it actually shows the jobs that um, are going to be, or going to have to be created for the future. Um, it, this, this particular report takes in um, the pandemic. It actually considers pandemic related disruptions in 2020. Um, it talks about the longer economic cycle. And so when you're sitting down with your high school student perhaps, or your post-secondary student to plan what kinds of work they are interested in. This is a great summary to look at. I'll give you the highlights. These were the highlights from it. 2025, analytical thinking, creativity, flexibility are the most sought after skills. Remote work is here to stay. The most competitive businesses will focus on upgrading their workers' skills because they know that what they're chaining their employees for now is not gonna be relevant in a few years. So I don't know about you, but I hear the word flexibility coming in big time. Gone are the days where you're training to be only this for your career, like, like my parents did. The robot revolution will create 97 million jobs. The workforce is automating faster than expected. This is the concerning part, displacing 85 million jobs in the next few years. So as a parent, I get it. I've, I've got a 19 year old and a 22 year old. I read this and I'm like, oh, like I feel a bit like, why are they gonna be prepared? How are we gonna prepare for all this? When, I, when my child comes home with a worksheet about commas or handwriting practice, how, or they're learning certain things in school that perhaps aren't going to address this. Or you're at home, you hear all this, and now you're dealing, I love this one, because you think about all the future, where we're going, and then this was my younger son. Like, how, how, how am I going to get him to succeed in this, this very modern tech-based, quickly advancing world when we can't even get out of the house? But don't worry, because 
we know that we can teach the skills that they are going to need. What we do need to know is the priorities are shifting. And if school isn't shifting quickly enough, there are opportunities as parents and caregivers and tutors to do this along with our students and along with our children. Any chance you have to enroll your kiddo in something that teaches these skills besides school, and, and I and there are some amazing schools right now that are that are really shifting to mold the curriculum around critical thinking, flexible thinking, flexibility. Um, but knowing that reskilling and upskilling are going to be the norm and following that trend. What can you enroll your child in or how can you support this at home? Because we know our prehistoric brains have not caught up. Our kids are in an age of information overload. We all are, not just our kiddos. We're all in this age of um, distraction and so many things are competing for our children's attention. And if you heard the, um, the Power Hour a couple of weeks ago, it was focused solely on attention, so I won't talk too much about that. Um, but there is a recording, so if you want to get the recording, let us know, um, and we can send that to you. It's focused on, <laughs> focused on attention. To me, attention is the gateway to all learning and career success. The science of executive functioning. So really quick snapshot, what is executive functioning? These are skills. So when I talked about those lagging skills in the brain that haven't been developed yet because these skills are developmental in nature. So I'm gonna pause and let that sit for a minute because I think we forget. These skills are developmental in nature. So what that means is you or your child were not born with these skills in place. They have to be learned and practiced over time. Some people, just like I equate it to riding a bike, some of us, you know, needed training wheels longer. Some people jumped on the bike, tried it a few times and got it, right? Some people, some kiddos have to have someone holding the back of the bike, maybe the training wheels are off, holding the back of the bike to steady them until they can ride on their own. So we know these skills are housed in the prefrontal cortex of the brain, right behind your forehead. They are the last to develop in the brain. The brains develop from back to front. So the last piece of the brain to develop is the prefrontal cortex, which is where all these beautiful skills are housed. Now, curveball, if you're dealing with a student child who has been diagnosed with ADHD, these skills of executive functioning are typically delayed approximately 30%. We're not talking intelligence. So this is where I wrote back to that sort of, that uh, diversion I talked about uh, with the psychoed report. So this is why when you get a psychological educational assessment, you really need to look at what skills are lagging as well as the intel, the, the WISP score, if you, if you find that information helpful. So if someone is very high intelligence score, but are lagging in these skills, it doesn't matter, right? These are the skills that need to be coached, practiced over time, and practiced over time, and practiced over time, there is no magic wand. I wish there was. <laughs> I wish we could just say, come to Kaizen, come to go to your counseling office. And there's this magic wand and all of these skills are developed. I'm sorry to say that's not true, but the hopeful good news is with practice, 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 structure and support, 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 these skills can be developed. So Christy, who's having her children clean the house today, layered in this stuff. That is a very practical example of building executive functioning. 
there is a correlation between chores and career success. Chores as a child in longitudinal studies. If your children do not have chores, they need to have chores. Ideally consistent ones. Every Sunday, do this. Every Monday, do this. Absolutely. Because there's so much. You think, oh, it's just, it's just taking out the garbage. When you think about taking out the garbage, when you think about loading the dishwasher, what's happening here? Well, you have to put your phone away because you have to focus on it. So that's impulse control. You have to remember where the dishes go, how they're loaded. If you were my mother, they're loaded in a very specific way. You should never forget that. <laughs> Task initiation. Without being nagged and nagged, did you start it? Maybe you do have to nag about to start it. Planning, prioritizing. Did you do it before you went out? Did you forget to do it? Self-awareness. Organization, time management. These, so you can see, I mean, how chores are so relevant. Just something to keep finishing a task and starting a task to ending a task. That carries over to school. So this is where, um, I don't know why I got that slide in there again. Okay, brain development matters. So remember how I said these skills are developmental in nature, print it out, put it a little sticky. When you're really frustrated at home, something's not happening, the homework skills are developmental in nature. Just go back to your mantra, okay? Or how can I help support build this executive functioning? Because the behavior of avoidance, not doing these things, not initiating a task, Avoiding a task is rooted in a lagging skill. What skill is lagging? Our little neurons in the brains, how we explain it to kids in our sessions and actually in our adult coaching now is, okay, obviously this is not biologically uh, <laughs> accurate diagram, but this is how we explain it and it works really well. We've got our little neurons here and how those um, neurons connect and the neurotransmitters between those nerves is science-based learning. In a developing brain, they're all over the place, right? They're not lined up evenly. In an ADHD brain, they are all over the place. And so how do we get those neurons to connect? The little hands, which are the axons and dendrites, passing the signals between the neurons through neurotransmitters like dopamine, in an ADHD brain that's quite lacking. We need this to build executive functioning. Practice as well lines up the neurons and creates the messaging. And the dopamine hit from getting a task completed. You're forming a pathway in the brain. Knowing that there are biological differences in developing brains, can be a strategy in itself. Okay, if you're looking at the structure, the function, and the chemistry of a developing brain, and we all know who have had teenagers, work with teenagers, this kind of all goes to shambles in the puberty years. But that's okay, because it's supposed to be that way. <laughs> this is how learning happens. This is how a child's brain determines what's important and what is, and we call it neural pruning. Okay, we throw out the stuff that we don't use and we keep the stuff we do use. And that's why practice, practice, practice makes permanent. Not perfect, but permanent. It's a permanent pathway in the brain. So these neurons being separated with these tiny gaps between the neurons called synapses, that's where we want to get those neurotransmitters talking. And in an ADHD brain, sometimes um, medication and skills training is what creates the bridge between the neurons. That's how med a stimulant medication works. So keep in mind, if you do have a student or child diagnosed with ADHD, please keep in mind their executive functioning age not necessarily their chronological age. 
to avoid da com like damaging comments such as you should be able to, you're 17. Why aren't you, why aren't you organizing your binder? What's wrong? Why can't you do that? Why can't you? You should be able to. So keep in mind, that's just my little, I know this isn't about ADHD, but I just want to, because ADHD and executive functioning deficit are the same thing. My other workshop, I go on a bit of a, that's another soapbox. ADHD is a misnomer. It's not a deficit of attention. It's misdirected attention. Should be renamed as an executive functioning deficit. So these skills in an ADHD brain are 30% delayed. So please, I've got a little chart here coming up. You know, if you have a 12 year old, executive functioning wise, plan and organize, this is a strategy, plan and organize for an eight year old, not intelligence wise, not interest wise. I'm talking like organization, time management, okay? I was working with a 17 year old and I, in a, in a school, and it was very difficult because I had to convince parents, or not parents, excuse me, teachers, grade 12 students going off to university, got a full scholarship, uh, athletic scholarship actually. And he was terrified, terrified. I said, you know, um, I don't, I can't say his name, Jonathan. I said, you must be so excited. Like you're, wow, congratulations. Like full scholarship, you're heading to California. And he said, I'm terrified. Come into my office, let's talk. So we sat down and I had to go to his teachers and say, he's 11 executive functioning. He needs help with his binder. He needs help from his parents to make sure he gets to school on time. He needs to make sure he's reminded to take his lunch to school. Mind boggling, right? Because you're like 17, you're going up to university. And he knew it. And that's where we get real. You got to be so careful because that's where you get the terror, the anxiety, the shaming. Like, Sam, he said, I'm going to university and I can't even pack my own lunch right now. Like, he knows. I'm like, sure you can because you just don't have a tool yet. You can do this, but they need to be set up for success. They do not need to be told you should be able to because they already know. They already know they can't unless there's support. So really becoming sort of a surrogate frontal lobe. Now, the argument I've had people say, Sam, you're spoon feeding. I've had teachers say this to me. I am not spoon feeding that 17 year old in grade 12. He has to learn. That leaves a pit in my stomach because there is a very different approach to spoon feeding and enabling and coaching and supporting for change. So coaching, supporting, and allowing independence with a tool or strategy, so powerful. Abandoning and just saying you should be able to, in my opinion, is cruel for, for a brain that can't do it at this point. Because trust me, there is no 17 year old that wants, well, maybe, maybe packing lunch. Everyone loves their lunch packed. But there's no 17-year-old that wants his mom or dad or caregiver to be saying, don't forget, don't forget, right? So what do we do? This is what, what the skills are looking like. How do, we, how do we help them thrive? You're like, give us strategies. Okay, here we go. I'm going to throw a bunch of strategies at you. Bear with me before we jump into strategies. Any questions or comments? Anything you want me to address right now before I jump into the building the executive functioning toolkit? Just use the chat or raise your hand. I'll take a sip of coffee. I might just jump in here really quick. Um, Dina, you asked a great question about if uh, you can have executive functioning problem. I think if you, Sam, if you were to go back to that slide of looking at what all those skill sets are, I think even as adults, mm -hmm. we recognize that there's going to be skills that we struggle with. And to the extent, you know, our students as well. 
Um, the interesting thing that I've seen, I think from our lens is that we are seeing a lot more people having this awareness that I really struggle with this skill or my child really struggles with this skill and then mm -hmm. taking the, the active steps to figure out what, what needs to be, um, you know, implemented to try to solve that. And for some people it's getting a firm diagnosis, whether it's through a psychologist or through a doctor. Um, and then once that's in place then you can really focus on what skills you want to be able to focus mm -hmm. on it and, and, you know, what, um, methodologies or maybe it's medication or whatever it is that needs to be implemented to try to help fill, fill some of the uh, voids or gaps in, in the learning profile. Thank you, Kristen. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, this isn't just a kid issue. I think one thing we need to start opening up the discussions around is normalizing that executive functioning is the new IQ. It is the new measure of potential, whether you're in the workplace or whether you're in, you know, boardroom or in, or in the classroom, right? Boardroom or classroom, these skills, and those of you that are working in teams and managing teams, I'm sure with another generation coming in, you're noticing some of these lagging skills because of, for so many other reasons, but um, yeah, we have a, we're working with different corporate groups right now for this very reason, often through children who come to us and they're like, do you do this for the workplace? Do you do this for adults? Yes, because um, we're all struggling with some of these skills. Whether you have ADHD or not, the, this is the nature of our world. Okay, jumping in. No more questions there, Kristen, in the chat or anything? Uh, we did have one from Christy, um, yep. just in terms of, and I think this is an interesting one, and especially I think as parents, we can all relate to this, where there's so much effort on our behalf to try to support our children or the mm. students we work with. And at what point do we kind of pull back because they need to start doing it? And I think it's a fine line, yep. right? As we just discussed with some mm -hmm. of this stuff, a lot of the, um, well, even just looking at the ages, right? Like if your child mm -hmm. is functioning, you know, well below where their age level is, there is going to be a lot of additional support that's required. Um, and mm -hmm. Jordan, you were just sending me a, a message too about how do we fix this? And, and one of the uh, common things that we often talk, talk about is this process of working on, you know, effectively building up that 30% or closing that gap um, really is a marathon and it takes time and effort and practice. And I think the biggest one um, is the habits, the things that we do, the small little meaningful steps that we can implement over a greater period of time that make the difference. Um, so I think that may answer your question, Dina. And as I jump into these specific strategies, there's those specific things that you can do. I've picked the highlighted ones. Trust me, we've got I mean, we have a whole practice on this, so I could spend weeks tell, sharing strategies. For now, in 20 minutes, I bear with me. I'm going to probably be another 20 minutes. I understand if you have to leave right at 10. Um, but these are kind of the, and maybe this gets to Jordan's question. These are the basic structures of what makes a huge difference in a home or a classroom. I will say generally, predictability structure but not control routine sleep <laughs> sounds so basic right you're like okay you wouldn't believe how many kids we work with who are getting four hours of sleep a night the brain is developing the body's developing well the brain is the body but you know what i'm saying Kids need sleep and they need predictable routine. Now I get it. If you have a teenager on the weekend, they stay up a little bit later. Okay. But for the most part, bed is at this time within half an hour and then phones off at this time, no screens, family time. Once a week, you're having a meal together at least right? We have to prescribe these things now. I know that sounds crazy for executive functioning development, but it's critical. We have family meals on these days, and those are our sacred days as a family, whether it's a Tuesday night or Wednesday night, but you decide as a family. Collaboration, so structure, predictability, 
okay? Not control, structure, predictability. Kids do not like impulsivity, believe me. They don't, they want to know what's going on. And we'll talk about a strategy for that. So general ones are, I'm going to make my screen bigger here. Man, my eyesight, you guys. I just got new glasses. <laughs> okay, keep things simple. So these are very general. Keep things simple. All right, I gotta make this bigger here. We're just Teach still on the, the sorry, Sam, I don't mean to interrupt you. We're just still oh. on the screen about the executive age. I'm not sure if you were switching. Oh, really? Or... Yeah. Yes, I am. Are you uh, not seeing my bubble? We just see the age and the delay. Oh, I'm so sorry. What happened there? Okay, sorry, team. Resume share. Oh, okay. Here we go. What do you see now? The... All of your little bubbles simplify mentor. Oh, okay. Well, okay. Let's go into slideshow here. So sorry about that. Do you see general yeah. tools? Okay. Simplify. Keep it simple. Don't complicate things. The more you, and this is rooted in brain research, trust us, but just offset the complexity going on in the brain. Teach the skills. If a child doesn't know how to organize a binder, how to organize a room. So when we say general things like go and organize, go clean up your room. I know it, it's like, yeah, uh, you know, that's pretty intuitive. Is that? What exactly does it mean to clean up your room? What are the expectations? How are you going to break down that task? It means clothes off of the floor. It means dirty laundry in the laundry room. We, you make up your list. You write that list down. You have a picture of it before and after. You can make it fun, right? Like bedroom makeover, right? Before and after. Humor is so key. Humor is so key, especially with teenagers. I know it's hard when they're just fighting you on stuff. But the more humor, sarcasm, a little edgy sarcasm goes a long way. Positivity, keeping your own emotions in check. Involve them. Don't be directive, but involve them. So, hey, I've noticed that, uh, I don't know, what's an example? Notice you're having a hard time getting your homework done today. And I think from here, like I just see you've got a math test tomorrow as well. Let's come up with a plan. What's going to be the plan here? How can I help you? Let's do this together. Support, not control. One of the taglines seemed to work. I know it doesn't work with all kids, but one of mine was like, hey, that's my job as a parent. I know you're not going to like this, but you know, my job, it's what I signed up for, right? It can be kind of funny for it. I signed up for this. Accountability. Don't just assume that something is going to be done independently. And then when it's not done, there's no, no person to check in. It does not have to be you, the parent. Start rallying around with your family members and friends. Who does your child really connect with? Maybe there's an uncle or a cousin or an aunt and you're like, hey, can you work with Jonathan just to like, not, not be his tutor, but can you check in with him? Can you help him? He really responds well to you. Cause we all know sometimes they're like, use your, use your community to help. And better yet, who can you help in your community? Routines, 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 predictability. What do you do on Mondays? What do you do on Tuesdays? Yes, there's, I get it, there's changes that happen and that's okay. And that's how we build in flexible thinking and sharing with our kids that sometimes things change, but for the most part, Tuesdays is baseball. Wednesdays is our family night, don't forget. And at all costs, you are home Wednesday for family night. That's just a non-negotiable. If kids know that, they will be there. They might grumble, but they'll, they'll do it if they know. When you get into the slippery slope is, oh yeah, you know, oh yeah, no problem, right? If you start to deviate from that or you do yourself, yeah, we'll skip it tonight. 
mentor, support, build your community, and provide real life opportunities. Meaning, can your child, and I'm talking teens, not, I mean, obviously it has to be age appropriate. Can your young person navigate a bus schedule? You drop them off in, say in Calgary, drop them off in Northeast Calgary. Can they get to, and make it fun, can they get to South Center? Down South. How are they going to do that? Can they do that? You're having a party. Let them okay, plan the grocery list, picking it up. If it's their party, they plan it. Give them a budget. Those are real life. It doesn't have to be in the classroom. Self-aware, give them natural opportunities in your world. Camping trips are great for that because there's a lot you got to do for a camping trip. <laughs> a lot of organization. Again, age appropriate. If it's a younger one, have them decide what toys they're bringing, what they're going to need um, for night routine, for example, and a little checklist, right? For a teen, I mean, if you get that they bring a friend, they can plan the whole thing. I mean, I'd have your own secret backup plan personally, but, <laughs> you know, you want to make sure you have some food and things, but you give them opportunities to plan, to prioritize, to organize, to budget. Give them a set amount of money when they're old enough and do the weekly shopping and say, here's 150 bucks and this has to last us for a week. I don't even know if that's possible anymore. Maybe $200, $300, <laughs> right? These prices are insane, but give them a budget and say, okay. And if they're going to university, Start that in grade 10. Or if they're going to any post-secondary, it doesn't have to be university. Start that. Be like, hey, I don't have time to grocery shop. Here's, here's my credit card, but you can only spend this amount. And this is what we need. Okay. Oops. This is a slippery slope. I know. I can't even explain to you how important this is in developing impulse control, whether you're talking about a phone, whether you're talking about alcohol use, whether you're talking about drug addiction, whether you're talking about relationships with kids, this is a practice skill. Remember, I'm gonna circle back, these skills are developmental in nature and need to be practiced. You cannot just suddenly expect a kiddo to put down their phone if they've been using it since grade four, and now you want them to stop in grade 11, but you can train that skill. It's harder as they get older, but it is possible and it's necessary. There's so much research to support that when we build control with this, we're building control in other areas of their lives because it's the neural pathway of immediate gratification and putting it off. Self-esteem, anxiety, all the concerns that are in this little thing uh, can be trained. And as a family, there needs to be a cell phone parking lot. As a family, whatever your family is, um, um, whoever is in your family. So you can't be on your phone. Well, you can be, but it doesn't work. If you're on your phone for business and, and you've told your kids that it's no phone time, that is a very tough, tough sell. But if as a family, you're committed to those boundaries, I guarantee your relationships will improve with each other. Moods will improve. Behavior will improve for everybody, not just kids. Okay, so figure out a time where there are no phones, there and or no screen time. I shouldn't just say phones. No screens. Allow them to move and advocate for this part at school. So if you see the, the title of the executive skill is impulse control on my slide, if you see a plus plus, it means it's layered with everything. Oh, oh, not everything. It's layered with other skills. So 
Meaning you, if you're teaching impulse control, it, it actually bleeds into a whole bunch of other executive skills that you're teaching. It's pretty amazing. So impulse control, my point of this slide is advocate for this, especially if you have a student with ADHD at home or a child at home with ADHD, allow them to chew and to have coffee or, or water or advocate for this at school. At home isn't an issue, right? But at school, no gum, no eating, no. And schools I've noticed are actually improving on that. So advocate though, if your child isn't allowed to chew gum or isn't allowed to chew candy, suck on candy, um, what I say, it has to be somewhat healthy. I say candy, but you can get some really good nutritional like little gummies that they can, um, not those kind of gummies, but <laughs> you can get gummies that are really good from the health food store allow them to orally stimulate because it's self-soothing for them. We used to serve popcorn in our office. We don't anymore because we're mostly online now, but popcorn's a dream for kids to keep attention. Here's our, our um, acronym for attention. Frequent breaks, organized spaces, chunking of activities. Give them unique ways to to move and please let them sleep. Create a structure for sleep. Eight to 10 hours. I know, it's a lot. I'm just gonna chime in here really quick, Sam. Um, yeah. Especially for as parents, right? We know that during those breaks, whether it be summer holidays or um, winter break, that oftentimes what happens is we see more of those natural sleep patterns emerge. And it's amazing if you look at it from that lens, if, if, if you have nothing to get up for and there's no other kind of impediments on what your schedule is, we will often see what the regular hours that a, a child or a student needs. And bringing that into the school week is something that's really challenging to do, but I think is needed because we often see very a lot of students who are, who are um, not getting enough sleep it makes a big, big difference in terms of how overall functioning takes place. And, and oftentimes, more importantly, all of the executive skills start going downhill, especially emo emotional regulation. Good point. The emotional regulation tied to all of these skills and emotional regulation is an executive functioning skill. So you will see if things are starting to go downhill, you will see, and that's where Dr. Green comes in, behavior and emotion, the, the behavior, the outburst, the anger, the language, whatever, whatever the behavior is, you can guaranteed it's a lagging skill it's, and it can be related to any of those. Don't know how to plan, don't know how to organize, sleep, will derail it all, lack of, I should say. And, you know, the older kids get, of course, um, we give them a little more freedom in those areas, but almost, we almost need to have more structure around those times as they are young adults, right? Like, I know you're going out tonight. Um, what do you think is going to be a reasonable time? Because we need to get those eight hours in for you, because we know if you don't, Right? How are we going to? And yes, I'm not saying every single time, but the general structure needs to be that if we want these this brain development to happen. The fMRIs are showing us this. True story. Chunking, um, so good. Chunking. A child gets overwhelmed with a task. Clean your room. Get the project done. Can't believe you're not getting the project done. Like it's due. It was assigned two weeks ago. How do you sit down? And we use this 20 and five method um, because starting is the hardest part for all of us. If you look at the project and you're like, oh, where do I begin is usually the first question. When will it end is the second question. And then how do I attack this? So if you can help your child to chunk down that, okay, first step, if it's the bedroom, Okay, first step is pick up the dirty clothes. Okay, second step is put the dirty clothes in the washing machine. Third step is organize your papers that are spalled around your room. Okay, you might even have to break that task down depending on, right? Set a timer so that the brain knows 
there's an end. 20 minute, it's like interval training. We can all do like, you know, you're in spin class or you're doing a sprint. If you know there's an end, you can push yourself hard, right? If you know it's never ending, we'll set that timer and say, okay, what do you think you can do? How fast? How much can we do in 20 minutes? When it goes off, you take a break, then come back to step two or three, whatever the activity is. Timers are amazing, actually. The analogy I use with kids and parents is if you're going to do 100 push ups, and I said to Rebecca, okay, 100 push ups, Rebecca, how are you going to do it? <laughs> right? So if I give you the option of like 100 now, or if you wanted to do 10 a day, Geraldine or Joy, you know, obviously doing 10 a day is going to be, I'm assuming, more manageable than if I said, Rebecca, do 100 right now. Right? So if you break it down, you can still complete the goal. We know that as adults, usually in project management or big projects, kids don't know this, students don't know this, 18 and 19 year olds don't know this. They are easily overwhelmed. They are then easily quick to go to this because this provides relief and feel good chemicals, okay? So that's why this has to go away when they're tackling something hard. Organized spaces um, are key um, because smart kids and smart people have busy brains, right? Our kids are smart, but there needs to be a structure to easily retrieve information. This is actually a real life example here. If your child's in junior high, senior high, elementary, upper elementary, um, I highly uh, recommend this one binder system for them to organize papers. If they don't use binders anymore at school and it's all online, okay, a beautiful thing because it's so available, but they don't look because it's out of sight, out of mind. There still needs to be a structure or routine in place to access that information. So that could be part of the routine. Come home. Let's check your Google Classroom or your Power School, wherever that information is housed. Okay, what are we going to print out? What are we going to print out that you're going to need? Let's create our own binder for this, right? Unfortunately, that's down to the home oftentimes now because they don't do that at school anymore a lot of times. Okay, and I'm very pro tech if it works. If it's not working, it needs. Sometimes we have to go back to our primal brains, right? Of what works. Hot summer back burner. This is a great anxiety reducer for kids that are easily overwhelmed. It's a great planning and prioritization technique. I use it corporately too with clients. Um, I'll finish up here in about one minute. Um, if your child, spouse, partner is freaking out because there's so much to do, a great question just to easily ask is, is it a hot, a simmer, or a back burner? Let's plan. So hot meaning it has to happen today. There are going to be grave consequences. Okay. Simmer. Okay. I've got one to two days to work on this. Okay. Back burner. Oh, that's not due for another two weeks. Okay. So then making that plan, we actually have a chart for this. If you sign up for our um, brain hub, uh, just through our website. I'll send it to you in an email too. Um, this is a tool and a template that we send out with one of our emails. So I will send that to you. I'm not even going to get into sleep because I feel like I've talked a lot about that. Um, do and done strategy is a great one. So getting a magnetic board that's visual. What you want your child team to do is bump into something. I know it's not very decoratively beautiful to have a big whiteboard. And I'm talking a big whiteboard. It doesn't have to be like this, but pretty big. That they actually bump into, meaning like it's at the front door when they leave or it's at the back door or wherever it is. And what you can do is get these magnets and you can write on there what needs to do. They can write on there, okay, let's break this project down. What are the steps of what has to we need to do before you get out the door. Pack your lunch, brush your teeth, make sure you have the signed form and I don't know, your soccer kit, okay? Do, write them up there, done. 
they move it over when they're done. This is a nagging, reducing, wonderful thing because all you have to say is go to the whiteboard. <laughs> nope, white, yeah, nope. Did you finish everything on the whiteboard, right? Done. They start to take control of this. Then they use the strategy. My son, still 19, living on his own in Victoria. I mean, I was a teacher at the time, so I have a massive teacher whiteboard <laughs> just in his, in his room, in his apartment. Life-saving for him, life changer. The last piece I want to talk about before you go is the importance of self-awareness. I have and meditation practices does obviously like not religious focused unless you're so inclined, but mindfulness practice. This is one I'm not affiliated with Headspace in any way, but I love this one. Um, so cute, first of all, for adults and kids, like such nice, beautiful graphics and uh, our graphics are based on this too. I just love their simplicity and they teach, um, there's a body scan in here. I was going to do it with you today, but we don't have time. I will send it to you. Um, beautiful time to just sit with your family or yourself or your child by themselves. If they're dysregulated and they're having a hard time, give them space and time and play one of these for them. There is a free version. There's a paid version. But they are beautiful little meditations. They have every age group. And if you, again, part of the routine, kids will say to me, doesn't work. Like when I tried it, doesn't work. How many times do you try it? Try it on Monday. Okay, and try it. That was it. I said, oh, no, 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 no. This is something you need to try three to four times a week. You need to make this part, of, like you're working out for your brain. Right. If you go to the gym once a week, it's okay. At least it's something. When are you going to see results? Four to five times a week, doing something. Ten minutes a day. We all have ten minutes a day. No matter how busy we are, we have ten minutes a day. Before we end today, um, oh, uh, I'll just leave this up as I talk. Um, you are welcome. We're capping our coaching because we're so busy. Um, we've decided to cap our coaching for the rest of this year. We're, we have, I think, 15 spots left now. So if you are looking at coaching again uh, for an adult or a student, please let us know. Um, and then we'll we'll be starting up again in September. But obviously, we're running guns a-blazing. But um, we've had a point of capacity, and we want to deliver quality, <laughs> not quantity necessarily. If you want free stuff, join our Brain Hub. Um, you'll get those, I think it's 14 weeks of free tools and strategies. We're developing a digital product that I'm super excited about. It's in beta testing mode right now. It's pretty exciting. We're using technology um, to help bring about uh, DIY coaching to families so that you can do, my goal is to provide all of this to our community so that they can use this at home. If someone can't do coaching for whatever reason, um, we have one more power hour coming up in a couple of weeks. Uh, a good friend of mine, Dr. Ashish Mehta, who's actually a dentist, but he's like a very talented magician and uses attention. So I thought this would be a great one for kids and adults to show how we, uh, how attention is, it's easy to miss what you're not looking for, put it that way. So that's kind of a fun one. Um, all of our, our presenters are volunteers. So I'd like to thank them because they do amazing work for us um, um, and they um, have provided their expertise with no charge, which is lovely just to share during the, these two months. Um, I think that's it for now. We're gonna hang around and answer any questions. I'm sorry I went over time. There's still more, but I will finish up the recording and send it to you. Just know, this is my final thought. There are no magic wands. It takes practice and practice and practice. And you're going to take a number of actions that don't show immediate results. And you're going to be like, ah, oh, oh, it's not working. Do them anyway. Because the small things you're doing over time, trust me, 
I can say that now because I've been in this industry for so long. I can say it does work. I think for our own longitudinal study, when parents, caregivers, coaches, educators come together as a community and you see those kids 10 years down the road, you're like, wow, it worked. But there are no immediate results. We still need you as part of the process. Coaching is not a replacement for all of what you do at home. I'll be very transparent about that. So if you are interested in coaching, we still need you. We need you to support those tools, right? But we are there to coach and supply strategies like this and coach your child and, or adult through that. Um, thank you for joining us today on your uh, Saturday. And please stick around for any questions you may have. And I wish you all a beautiful day wherever you are. Kristen, I think you're muted. I do see your lips moving. Yeah, up. sorry, thanks. <laughs> I was just gonna say, it sounds like we've got a few questions too about the reluctancy piece, which is a, I think a big mm -hmm. area that uh, we experience. Sam, do you wanna talk about that? Absolutely. Um, can you, uh, what's the question? Sorry, like just Yeah, just like what happens? Yeah, like not unmotivated students who don't really wanna try. Or... Yeah, um, again, behavior is an indicator, right? So. What is the lagging scale or unsolved problem? How do we drill down what that is? So motivation um, comes from success, feeling successful, feeling in control. So my question would be, is it specific to um, a certain activity? Is it motivation in general? Um, is it down to a certain subject at school? I would ask, I would want more information to be like, okay, where is this showing up, right? because maybe motivation isn't bad when you're getting up to go skiing because you love that and you're part of a team and you feel successful in that. If it's doing an essay about, I always pick on the fur trade. I'm so sorry, but it's, maybe that's all about me. But if you're doing an essay about the fur, fur trade, just because that's in our curriculum for so many years, super interesting at the beginning, by grade 12, right? It's like, oh man. So if that is a topic, is it that is it there's a lagging skill of what it takes to do whatever that is um a huge motivator is timing timer okay i know this is gonna you're not motivated to do this how long do you think you can work on this before you stop 10 minutes five minutes i don't know what is that for that kiddo set the timer go break it into chunks it's hard when you're not interested in something. We all know that, right? I'm not sure if that answered the question. I, I wanna know more, right? Yeah, I think it's just generally when there's an uninterest, yeah. right? When you're not interested in doing something and I think mm -hmm. you nailed it, just trying to short manageable chunks. Mm -hmm. um, to the same mm -hmm. extent, I might piggyback on that and say, um, finding those extrinsic motivators, right? If you do something, you know, a little bit each day, maybe it's like, okay, well, now that you've worked on this for 10 minutes over the course of this week, it's Friday, you get to pick what's for dinner tonight or something like that. Mm -hmm. And again, finding something that's age appropriate that'll work with your child. And again, to just, you know, have that little bit of motivation and inspiration to try to get them to, to work towards that mm -hmm. common goal. And maybe you work on that. It's dangling that carrot. What is the what is your child going to be responsive for that you can easily implement? It doesn't have to be a financial one. It could be, you know, as simple as what I just described, picking up that or what mm -hmm. movie we get to watch this weekend or something like that. Mm -hmm. Various ways you can implement it. Immediate, especially if it, uh, ADHD brains, um, immediate reward is so important too. Immediacy. So what's the immediate, because there's that timeline this piece, right? So what is the immediate reward of doing that? Okay, 10 minutes, start here, then let whatever. And picking out, and even collaborating on that together, what's the reward? What is the reward? Because that is a life skill, right? Because you're gonna go to work and do a lot of things you really don't like. There's a lot of things you will like because you've chosen your career, but there's gonna be things you don't like. So how do you, for me, it's spreadsheets, as Kristen knows. <laughs> How do you get this done when it's like 
looking at a pile of laundry. I'm a big timer person. For me, that works well. Um, timers, there's an online timer you can use too. And then I get up and I actually do something in my house. Like I actually physically do something that makes me feel good. Any other questions? We've still got a few people hanging on. Feel free to unmute yourself too if you'd like. Yeah, assistive technology. There's so much assistive technology now. I see that in the chat quite a lot. Anything for writing, reading, there's so many great softwares out right now that uh, can really help um, with the writing process. Even just using, having, again, just starting, usually for kids, a lot of kids, it's the essay writing piece, uh, getting the ideas down. So even just saying, okay, let's just talk into the microphone on a Google Doc. It's free, very accurate now. Didn't used to be, but now it is. Let's just talk it out. And they, it's so cool to see their reactions when they start speaking their ideas and the words are coming out. They're like, I can do it. I'm like, yeah. And then you can go back and edit and move and change, but just to start. Motivation comes from momentum, right? Just to start. Five minutes, two minutes. You know, when they're teaching, uh, there's a great book. Um, uh, is it The Talent Code or is it Atomic Habit? Oh, it's Atomic Habit. Such a great read. And uh, one of the studies is getting people to the gym. People had some really big health concerns and they make them go to, they're part of a study. They go to the gym, they get them all dressed new outfit, new shoes, everything. You go to the gym and you work out on the treadmill for five minutes and then you leave. And they cannot work out past five minutes for the first week, I think it is. And then, and so of course you're like, man, I got dressed. I went to the gym, I did all this work. And now you're telling me five, but it's habit, forming those habits in the brain, like craving, like, okay, I'm gonna stay for at least 15 minutes now because I've done all this. Why wouldn't I see how this working, right? Okay, sure, half an hour. That's not that bad. Incremental steps, that's what Kaiza means. Progressive and continuous improvement, small changes leading to bigger outcomes. Okay. Rebecca, so good to see you. I miss talking to you. Thanks so <laughs> much. Today was really good. And even though, you know, I've been down this road for a while now, it still just brings up more things and you just think, yes, there's more I can do. And some things to really appreciate it very much. Oh, I'm so glad to hear that. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Thank you. So good to see you. Thanks for coming, Rebecca. It's nice to see you. Rebecca is the loveliest soul. She is a strong, smart, amazing woman. She's someone you talk to and you leave the room and you're like, amazing. Like just inspiring. Oh, you're still here. <laughs> Thank you. I'm talking about you. <laughs> I know. My ears are burning. <laughs> Thank you all very much. Bye. I'll see you Bye. later. Yeah. Yeah. I'm we're struggling thought. with my daughter who's now 18. Mm-hmm. And uh, she does have some executive functioning deficits and possibly ADHD, according to the psychoeducational assessment. Um, mm -hmm. um, there was some, this thing of whether it was the anxiety and some depression that she has, whether that was presenting as ADHD or not. Mm -hmm. um, she actually did some sessions uh, for quite a while with Kaizen. Mm. But she doesn't seem to buy in mm. and follow the strategies. That is the challenge we seem to have with the buy in. Yeah. And she's 18. You said she's Krista, now 18. Can you close yeah. the recording on oh, your end? Yeah, Sorry, I sure can. Shut the recording. Thank you. Um, she's 18. Great.